today on The Snack Covenant. So basically, Marika has all of these kids, and the only one she really seems to care about is Godwin. Godwin was born, and she's like, okay, I have a successor. I don't need the other kids. Then Goemide Queen is born, and then Marika's like, okay, so as the second born, your entire purpose is stop your brother from dying. Oh, it's like those stories you hear when somebody has a kid, and the kid is sick, so they have a second kid to kind of take care of the first kid. Kind of, yeah. Please note that today's podcast gets a little heavy when we talk about the god skins. For this reason, we have Jersey Miyazaki provide some comic relief toward the end of the episode. Hi, Sophie. Hi, Sin. Hi, everyone. And welcome to the Snap Covenant, episode 317. You laugh earlier every single time that number <laughs> gets bigger. And today we're talking about the Glomite Queen. This was a very heavily requested topic because uh, she's someone that the game sort of like talks about a bit. She's a little bit like Velka, but not really, and that she's mentioned a lot. It sort of points toward who she might be, but the question of who she is, is I think like if you go with the answer the game is pointing toward, it raises more questions than it answers. So what we're going to do in this episode is just go over like not necessarily like who she is in an identity sense, but like where she came from, what she's done, or what might have happened to her. And if she is that thing, then how is she that thing? So this is more of an episode to facilitate everybody's brains toward the global queen. Facilitate the brain. <laughs> it's like a Bloodborne mistranslation that Loki would complain about. <laughs> Who is the game pointing her toward being? The game is heavily implying she either is or is very closely connected to Melina. So tell us a little bit about the Glomite Queen. So Glomite Queen's a character that we never explicitly meet. She's mentioned a few times. I think she's only mentioned like three times in the whole script. And one of them calls her the Dusk-Eyed Queen instead of the Glomite Queen. Uh, Glom is just not the name for Dusk. So... Despite that, who she is is treated as someone very, very significant in that she is the leader of the Godskin Apostles slash Godskin Nobles, who are a recurring mini-boss that we encounter. Sometimes they're a complete boss in the Godskin Dio fight. The reason they're significant is that they are wielders of the Black Flame. That is the thing that the gods are really frightened of. It's derived from the Rune of Death. It can slay the gods, and the Godskin's whole deal is we're going to go kill the gods. And wear their skins. And wear their skins, yeah. So... <laughs> There's this cult of people, question mark, we don't really know what they are, who are going around using the black flame to slay the gods, skin them, and then wear the skins. Sophie. Yes. They wear the skins. Do they eat the insides? It does specify that, like, the godskin noble robe, they deliberately keep all the fat in it. Mm-hmm. So it's it's got quite good defense. It's like, okay. it's like, it's like you're wearing, like, a really, really thick coat. So it's good isolation. So they must be from Canada. Well, I think they I think they are from the mountaintops. <laughs> Sophie, I just had a vision. So the god skins kill a god, skin mm -hmm, them, mm -hmm. and then they're like, what are we going to do with all these insides? And they're like, Alexander, do you want these? I mean, yeah, kind of. Like, I think this is all connected. Not maybe on like a... <laughs> It's one of those things in Elden Ring where there's like, there's all these motifs that repeat, like the, the fusion of bodies and people being like fused together and broken apart again. And it's like, they don't necessarily all need to be connected on a literal narrative level. Like we talked about this before where like, you know, Godfrey, Godric is grafting stuff onto himself. Godfrey is grafting a lion onto himself. Alexander is filling himself with guts and all this other stuff like that. Marika and Radigan are fused. They're not all the same. They're not part of the same story, though. Like, it's just like this is a thing that recurs in the world, but it's not necessarily like narratively all one process. You know, what you're saying here is giving me a very Hellraiser vibe. Do you know what that means? Oh, no. It means that Elden Ring is not a Dark Souls-like. Therefore, it's not a fantasy because it's a Hellraiser-like. Therefore, it's cosmic horror with gore. Therefore, it just became a game I like a lot more. That's one way of looking at it. You know, like, I have a game 
relativity scale on my head. So yeah, just, and, and you is know, the scale objective or subjective? It's very objective. Good, good. That's the only kind of scale I'm interested in. <laughs> so it just went up a spot. Thank you. Great. On to uh, number 123. <laughs> That's number 123, just above the original Dark Souls. <laughs> Numbers 1 to 122 would just fall out. <laughs> What's the Glomites Queen's history? So he, historical kind of situation is very interesting. When you look at like the sequence of events, Elden Ring is very vague about a lot of its timeline, but there's also like a clear cause and effect thing going on that you can sort of follow. So big questions about, like, when did they build Elendel? When did the Three Fingers show up? Things like that. It's a little hazy, but you can also look at, like, okay, this happened because this happened because this happened, and sort of put an order together like that when you're talking about characters. What's super interesting about the Glomide Queen is actually how early on she shows up. Now, when we talked about Marika and Death in our episode entitled Marika and Death... <laughs> Oh, good for us. You know, it's easy to find. Um, yeah. We mentioned that, like, okay, so what Marika did was she's got the Shard of Death from the Elden Ring, the Rune of Death. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to make basically all the gods and herself, like, never die and kind of control how death functions by putting the rune inside of Malekith. So, like, that's the one thing that can hurt her. She's taken it out of the Elden Ring. She's put it in Malekith. Mm -hmm. There's actually a phase in between those two things. So if you look at, like, when Malekith got the Rune of Death, he actually gets it from the Glomide Queen. So the way it's described is that Malekith is sent by Marika to get the Rune of Death from the Glomide Queen, which means that the Glomide Queen had it before Malekith did. And we know that, at least according to, like, the, the little hints we get, the birth of the Golden Order is kind of heralded by marika removing the rune of death from the elden ring like that's when she creates like here's my order here's how the world's going to function and my sort of creation moment the like let there be light moment that sort of puts everything in so like locks the way the world will work into a certain sort of system is she takes death out of the elden ring that's what makes the golden order it was what makes it different to like other iterations of like how the ring has worked mm -hmm. so when she removes it there's a period of time when Malekith doesn't have it and the Glomide Queen does have it. Okay. We also don't hear about any other squabbling over who gets the Rune of Death. Like, pretty much the only two things that have ever had the Rune of Death, well, three things, I guess. Historically, two, and then there's, like, a third one. Historically, it just goes directly from the Elden Ring to Glomide Queen, then Malekith gets it from the Glomide Queen, and then Rani gets it from Malekith. So we don't hear about anyone else. So it looks like what actually happened was when Malekith first removed that Rune from the Ring... She gave it to the Glomide Queen. So the Glomide Queen was around at that point. Uh -huh. And she got the rune. What's really interesting there is that the Glomide Queen, in one of the very, very few references there are to her in the script, they say that she was an Empyrean that was chosen by the Fingers. The simplest way to explain what Empyrean means in the game, and I'm sure there's some other long explanation in one of George's notebooks, but based solely on what we actually see and hear in the game. Empyrean just means someone who is next in line to the throne. So Marika's kids are Empyreans. It's like Mikola's an Empyrean, Melania's an Empyrean, Rani's an Empyrean. Glomide Queen is also an Empyrean. Godwin, we can kind of like assume was also an Empyrean. I think they ever call him that, but he's definitely described like, okay, he's, he's literally and figuratively the golden boy. So if... Glomai Queen was an Empyrean, that kind of implies she may have been one of Marika's kids. And it's also interesting that it says she was chosen by the Fingers. So it's like, after Marika set everything up, the two Fingers pick, like, the Glomide Queen. It's like, okay, you're a potential successor. So she's someone who's very important. She's not, like, um, some weird, like, mountain priestess of the Deathbirds or something like that. She's not, like, one of the Nox. She's not an astrologer. She's not one of the Giants. She's someone who's, like, approved to kind of take over. And this kind of ties back to the Melina thing, because, like, Melina specifically talks about having a mother. And she says, like, her mother gave her her purpose within the Erd Tree. 
And there's only one mother that we know of that's in the Erd tree, which is Marika. So basically, this all sort of implies that the Glomide Queen's one of Marika's kids. And because she's very, very early on in the timeline, she looks like she's one of the first. What I'm kind of getting is, like, she would have been born around the same time as Godwin. Like, again, the game doesn't say this, but it's sort of like, it's implicit in the way everything functions. Godwin's the firstborn, or at least the heir. Marika's putting everything into Godwin rather than her other children. So when Godwin dies, like, it doesn't just that it messes up the way that death works, because he has the weird half-death and gets buried in the tree. It also breaks Marika, because Marika herself has put everything of her into Godwin. So she mm-hmm. doesn't have, like, a plan B. Mm-hmm. The other interesting thing about Queenie is that she's only ever called the Gloom-Eyed Queen. She's never given a name. We know, like, there is another character in another From game that that happens with. That's right, George. (laughs) Tell us about George, Sim. Well. Interesting that the character with no name is called George. (laughs) You see, he went against his father's wishes and sided with dragons, and then his name was erased from all records. Yeah, his name, George, was erased from all records. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so Sim is, of course, talking about the nameless king, George. (laughs) Hello everybody! Today's episode is quite long, so remember to hydrate yourself and stretch when necessary. We're sorry there were no videos uploaded last month. We're busy editing episodes now though, and they'll be up on the channel as soon as possible. If you'd like to hear early edits of episodes, bonus episodes, or just support the channel in general, you can do so at patreon.com slash sinclairlore. Now, back to the podcast. So Nameless King is a similar kind of character in that it's like a member of the royal family who was erased from history. They're still remembered, but they're only remembered as the Nameless King. They're not remembered as like a specific person. The difference is that For Nameless King, it's happened after he's kind of established himself. Like, there were statues of the Nameless King in Anor Londo. There were altars to him throughout Lordran. He had, like, a relationship with characters in the game. He had, like, a cult that worshipped him of these, like, warriors who still survive to the day. Like, all this stuff happened before he was expelled. Whereas with Glomide Queen, it looks like she's cut off right at the beginning. The only thing of the Glomide Queen that survives is the Godskin Cult. And it's also, like, there is a sword called the Godslayer Greatsword, and it mentions that is the sword of the Glomide Queen, but it's not clear if that means it's, like, the sword that she wielded, or if it's just, like, a sword that's associated with her. So basically, there's, like, two things left over of the Glomide Queen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing about talking about Glomide Queen as someone that was relevant a very, very long time ago is that you mentioned that she may have come from Canada, aka the mountaintops (laughs) of the Giants. Yes. Now, that is, like, kind of ground zero for the Golden Order in a lot of ways. Like, the Golden Order kind of begins flourishing after Marika and Godfrey defeat the Giants together. Okay. And at that point, like, it specifies they had the Elden Ring at that point. So it's not like they conquered everything, then Marika got the ring, then she creates the Golden Order. It's like she wants to create the Golden Order. She has the ring. They just need to make sure that the giant forge is sealed so the Erd Tree can't burn. Okay. Okay. So that all happens in the mountaintops. And I mentioned before, like, there are recurring Godskin Apostle and Godskin Noble bosses in the game. There's also a boss in the mountaintops that is calling forth the spirits of those things. Okay. So it's calling forth, like, the spirits of, presumably they died a long time ago, like the ghosts of a godskin noble and a godskin apostle. It's it's actually a snail that's doing it. These things called the spirit (laughs) caller snails. And it's summoning up their ghosts. And that's the only time you encounter, like, the ghosts of them. And you'll remember that, like, the mountaintops, it's full of ghost things. It's got, like, ghost trees and ghost animals. It's got a lot of, like, the death birds and, like, the carrion-eating crows and things, because so many things died there. Mm -hmm. Like, the mountaintops was basically, like, it was, like, scoured by this flame. 
like combination of the flame and like the battle that was going on, you find these remnants of like the flame in these like sort of blossom, these flame blossoms. Um, mm-hmm. Basically like the place was like destroyed and the things that died there seem to live on as these ghosts, these like ghost deer and ghost trees and things. Um, the Godskin nobles seem to be part of that. And when you defeat them, when you defeat the snail anyway, you get a thing called the Godskin swaddling cloth. That's like a holy sort of relic for the Godskins. So it's possible that actually, like, the defeat that happened at the hands of Malekith, that happened in the snowfields, and that's why all that stuff's left behind. So it's something that happened, like, quite a long time ago. That's probably why, like, there's not much evidence of the Glomide Queen, like, doing anything in the world other than founding the Godskins, because it would have happened in the mountaintops, and then the whole thing would have just been, like, basically nuked. So there's nothing left behind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, the other thing about her, again, like tying into like, well, what happened to her? Is she Melina? Is she someone else? It never, as far as I can tell, specifies she died. It says she was defeated. And remember, like the whole deal with Marika and the Rune of Death is having removed the Rune of Death from the Elden Ring. The gods can't die. That's like the whole point of it. So you couldn't technically, I guess, kill the Glomide Queen if you'd removed the Rune like that. Unless you actually use the rune against her, which is possible. It gets kind of confusing. Um, But basically, in removing the rune, you've kind of made the Glomide Queen someone who can't die. Which might explain, like, why Melon is like, hey, I'm here and I'm burned up and I don't know why and I don't know who I am. But I'm still alive and I'm not sure why. Uh That sort of fits with, like, is she someone, did, did she die but not die and come back? So tell me about the Melina and Glomite Queen relationship. Okay, so this is the part where it's like, is she or is she not Melina? Is like, yes. So there's a lot of information that links Melina and the Glomite Queen. I'm saying links because like, they're not necessarily one in the same, and I don't think they are one in the same person. Um, Elden Ring really likes the idea of characters not necessarily being a stable, self-contained person. So you have characters who are like, uh, like you have Radagon and Marika who are individuals, but also one person. You've got like the D twins who are actually do appear to be two separate people, but they're joined at the soul. And you have like, you know, um, Mikola, who is also Centrina and Centrina's identity themselves is like, it's not clear who they are because they're, they're perceived differently by different people. I mean, like Godric sticking different body parts on himself. You've got like Godfrey fusing with Sarish. Like it just happens all the time. So um, I think the idea of there actually being just like a stable, like Melina becomes the Glomide Queen, the Glomide Queen becomes Melina, is unlikely to be like what they're actually getting at because they're more interested in those sort of very weird, like fractured, broken, um, sort of recombined relationships between people. So the example that like, everyone kind of points to is like, oh, there it is, is the Frenzied Flame ending. If Melina leaves you at the Frenzied Flame prescription and then you proceed through the game, what will happen is she will reappear at the ending and she looks different. Like it's the same model, but her hair has gone black. It's usually like a strawberry blonde. Her hair has gone black and the eye that has been closed throughout the game has opened, and it's glowing this sort of unnaturally, like, violet blue, which itself is kind of associated with those who live in death. And um, the eye that's usually gold has gone dull. She turns, essentially turns to camera, and says, like, (laughs) I'm going to get you for that, and I'm going (laughs) to use destined death, which is the Glomide Queen's whole thing about, like, the rune of death and being the death of the gods and everything. Yeah. So that on its own sort of points toward like Melina and the Glome Queen being connected. The issue is that outside of that, Melina and the Glomide Queen don't really sound like one another. Okay. Like the Glomide Queen's whole deal is she is leading a murderous cult that skin people <laughs> and <laughs> wants to like, you know, their, their goal is we will be the death of the gods. Um, right. Melina herself, like she never reacts to or mentions like the god skins. She doesn't show any sort of evil intent. She just sort of seems a little confused sometimes. But it's important to remember that when you first meet her, she's got amnesia. But she does specify that like, I'm looking for my purpose. And she says her purpose was lost a long time ago, but it was given to her by her mother inside of the earth tree. Mm-hmm. So it's, again, they don't say it, but they do say it. The mother is Marika. Marika gave Melina a purpose 
big question mark over what happened next, but Melina burned up, like her body burned up. Um, she's essentially a ghost at this point. Her hands are quite badly burned, if you have a look at those, and her eye is sealed shut. So she spends the game basically saying, hey, take me to Landell, because when I get to Landell, I'll understand like what's going on, I'll understand my purpose. When you do arrive at Landell, she honors that, and she actually disappears. So essentially the entire time between the avenue balcony in Landell and the fight with Morgoth, she's not there. She's somewhere else. So when you finally get to Morgoth, Melina becomes available as a summon. She's quite savage when she fights. Like she's flailing around. She does these, she actually does the same moves that the Black Knife Assassins do, which is probably significant because they're the ones who had the Rune of Death. She's firing these like projectiles from her dagger. Um, and she can she can wreck Morgoth pretty badly. <laughs> and then after that, it's like, oh hi, I'm back. Yeah. And she mentions to you that basically she's got her memory back now. Like off screen, when you were running around Landell, Melina was like, we don't know what she did. Did she go to the Erd Tree? Did she commune with someone? But she basically it all came back to her at some point. So that's the point at which like her memory is restored, her purpose is restored. It's not like there's a massive change in her personality, but she does pivot quite quickly toward let's unseal the rune of death and burn the Erd Tree down, which is not something she's really shown any interest in having like been part of before. So that's sort of like, oh, okay. It's come back to her and she's suddenly talking about burning things. She's suddenly talking about the rune of death. This is something that they do have to do. Like... The burning of the Erd Tree via unsealing the forge, like we'll talk about this in another episode we're going to do later on, but it looks like they have tried this before. So this is not just only the Glomide Queen would know of this. It's like something that, that they would have done before. But she pivots to it very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing is that when you are sacrificing her in the forge, she says two interesting things. She says, like, I have long observed the lands between, thus implying she has been around for a very long time. She's gone from, I don't know who I am, I've lost my purpose, to... Let's burn the Erd Tree down, and I've seen, like, all of history unfold. And when she finally, like, burns herself, she says that what the world needs is indiscriminate death. She's tying back into, like, Marik has screwed everything up by removing death from the from the um, Elden Ring, which created this whole situation, right? So we're starting to get to this point where, like, Melina is... She's not going full on, I will be the death of the gods, for I am the Glomide Queen. But she's going, like... You know, we need to bring death back. The Erd Tree needs to burn. That's what came back to her when she got to Landell. Um, the other thing of note is the eye. This character is known as the Gloam Eyed Queen. Just kind of a giveaway. The eye is probably important. Melina's eye is sealed shut throughout the game up until the Frenzied Flame ending. And it's, it glows with the same sort of light that the Beast Eye glows with that Gorunk gives you. And that's like an eye that sort of seeks out death. The other thing is that there's like a tattoo across Melina's eye. Now, the beast eye itself and the beast, um, the claw mark seal, they both have this like three fingered diagonal scratch across them. The beasts are described as having five fingers that was granted them by the gods, but all their designs are based around there being a three a three fingered scratch. It's entirely possible that was done with the hand with five digits, just the, just only the middle three are long enough to make the scratch. That sort of makes sense. Um, so that's sort of tying back to oh, did Gwen Garank sealed the Glomide Queen's power? Did he do it by like scratching her eyes shut? And like that, I think that's what they're getting at, like symbolically. That the issue is that what's on Melina's eye is a tattoo of a claw. It's not a claw mark. Like it looks like someone drew a claw over her eye. Counterpoint. Yeah. What if he really did claw her, but she went to a tattoo artist and she was like, "Can you cover this up and make it into a tattoo so it looks?" I mean, nicer? that is possible. But that can still be like, we don't know how Malekith seals her power. We don't know how Malekith defeats her. It is possible that it was, it's like a symbolic thing where like in doing that, like the sign of the claw was placed above her eye or something. But the point is, it's not a design we see anywhere else. People have likened it to the the foul foot items that you get. It's like the claw of a bird. It could be the claw of the death birds. Um, the death birds themselves confuse things massively because you could very easily say it was the death birds, except the death birds are associated with death sorcery not the black flame like it gets a very confused all these different kinds of death that are that are moving around the world other thing i guess is the hair because melanas when you meet her she's like a strawberry blonde and in that ending her hair goes black we actually see something similar to that with marika and radagon 
where Marek has initially got the blonde hair, and then as she changes to Radigan, her hair goes red. That's right. Yeah, and um, there's this whole thing in the game about linking hair to, like, your innate essence, as weird as that sounds. So, like, I think the idea is the giants having the red hair, that all goes back to, like, there's this, like, god of flame that dwells within the giants, and it's manifesting through giving them this red hair. Mm-hmm. And, like, Marika being, like, Marika of, like, the golden power of, like, the greater will and the Elden Ring, the gold manifests in this shining golden hair that, like, all of her offspring have. Melanie getting the black hair, like, we don't see any demigods that have that black hair, but black is obviously, like, it's a death thing. It's, like, associated with, like, like the black, sort of, like, the black flame and, like, the black rune of death. So it's almost like there is something of the Glomide Queen in Melanie that resurfaces, if she doesn't burn herself up. So do you think Melina is the Glomite Queen? I don't think the Melina character that we meet is like, I'm secretly the Glomide Queen, I'm just not telling you. But they're clearly connected on some level. Um, it's not clear like what went on exactly. Uh, Glomide Queen might have been like reincarnated as Melina. You know, Melina might be like a fragment of the Glomide Queen, um, there's a whole thing about, like, people are sort of reborn out of the Erd tree. Reborn. Reborn. So, Sophie. Yes, Sin. What's happening with the Glomite Queen? Okay, so we've sort of gone over what we know about her. Mm-hmm. And then now it's like, well, why is this happening? Like, what does she actually want? Like, why why is she doing this? Why did she do this? How is Melina involved? Why are the Godskin skinning people? Things like that. So um, we're going to assume she probably wanted something more than just skinning people. <laughs> so we know that Marika uses the Glomide Queen as this like initial vessel for Destined Death. And then Malekith has to come and get it from her. So again, it doesn't say this outright, but it only makes sense if that means, like, at some point, like, the Glomide Queen turned against the gods. Like, obviously she is against the gods. That's the whole thing. They're going to be the death of the gods. Um, little interesting detail is that, like, there's um, there's seven thrones at the base of the Erd Tree, and the godskins have seven faces sewn on their aprons, which is probably a little ominous if you're one of the people in the thrones. Um, <laughs> but, like... It's like psychological intimidation. Well, yeah. Well, it is. You're wearing someone's skin. Like, but yeah. also, well, not only am I wearing your skin, the number is going to mess you up because it's the number of the thrones in your room. It's like double intimidation. Yeah, yeah. If that was always happening, Marika would not have given the rune of death to these people. <laughs> like, it's a very bad idea. It's like the worst people who could possibly have it. So we have to assume here that like yeah. the Glomite Queen was initially on the side of Marika, or at least under yeah. Marika's control. And then at some point, that's when her and the Godskins turn against Marika. And that's when she has to send Malika. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 We do have evidence also of like just the Black Flame of Death can, um, it just says it enthralls people. There's a character called um, Black Flame Monk Amon, and it's like he was someone who was like he was a flame monk, and then basically, it's not clear exactly what happened, but like he saw the Black Flame and he became like, oh, Black Flame, I will now serve the Black Flame instead of the the Red Flame. So like the, it is sort of in there like, yeah, okay, sometimes people just go a little crazy with the Black Flame and they start like serving it. But that is, I think, like not that good a uh, a story for her it's just like yeah she just went a little power mad with this black flame because it doesn't sound like something that would really happen um yeah because elden ring is obviously a lot of the characters in it are someone who like went mad with power like that's they say that literally in the intro like the mad taint of the strength triggers the shattering but they're, again they're not just like i'm going to be powerful there's always like a reason behind it and the power is used to articulate that mm-hmm. so i want to look at like the Glomide Queen being driven by her relationship with Marika, because that's, like, I think the main recurring theme of, like, Elden Ring and how the demigods function is that Marika is trying to shape her children into, like, ideal vessels for the next, like, to be the next king or the next queen or the next lord. She's trying to make them into that. In doing so, she makes them into absolute 
self-destructive monsters to the point where the only one who's actually doing what he's told is a literal, like, goat monster who Marika doesn't like. Basically, the reason the demigods are as fucked up as they are is that they're encouraged to be that way. Yeah. So what we're going to talk about now is, like, this implied relationship between the Glomide Queen and Godwin. Godwin being, like, we brought this up before, Godwin is, like, the most important demigod up until the point where he dies. Marika has Godwin, and then she also has, like, Morgod. She has Moog. Godric's not her direct child. He's actually, like, he's, like, the grandson or something of Godwin. Merrick, and there's all like the the demigods, like the soulless ones that are left in the in the crypts that are walking around. So basically, Merrick has all of these kids, and the only one she really seems to care about is Godwin, and she seems to care about him like way more than is healthy. So like Godwin's got all these statues erected in his honor. He's like we obviously we don't meet him like as he was then. We find his corpse, but we don't really interact with him. But like all indications are like yeah, he was like this great warrior. He was this he was beloved by everyone. Um, you know, he he was he sort of fought the dragons and he actually made friends with them because he was just so great. There's all these statues in him. Like he's incredibly beloved. And you look at that and you compare it to like Morgoth. Morgoth is like kicked out and made to live in a sewer. Yeah. She doesn't seem to care, but she's pouring all of herself into Godwin to the point where like her wanting to protect her children from death, it seems more like she just wanted to protect Godwin from death. Because like she's decided my success is going to be Godwin. So I have to I have to pour everything I have into him and I have to keep him alive. And if I have to sacrifice my other children to do it. That's what I'll do. This is why I'm always saying, like, again, the game doesn't actually outright say this, but I think it's fairly clear that Godwin's the firstborn. Like, her and Godfrey have a kid. He's going to be the next in line because he's the firstborn, uh, firstborn son, presumably. So that becomes, like, okay, this is the kid, and it's it's like William and Harry. Like, we have an heir, and then we'll have a spare. Who's William and Harry? The princes. Prince William and Prince Harry. Oh. The reason I'm bringing this up is that, like, we know Glomide Queen happened a long time ago, like, at the very beginning of everything. So I am wondering if what actually happened here was that Godwin was born, and she's like, okay, I have a successor. I don't need the other kids. Then Glomide Queen is born either, like, it's possible they were twins. Okay. It's also possible she was born after him. And then Marika's is like, okay, so as the second born, right, I have my heir, now I've got my spare. And your, your goal, literally, your entire purpose is stop your brother from dying. Oh, it's like those stories you hear when somebody has a kid and the kid is sick, so they have a second kid to kind of take care of the first kid. Kind of, yeah, yeah. And it basically, like, she's gone to, okay, this is the one thing that can harm your brother. Just look after this thing. Make sure nothing hurts your brother. So when we talked about Marika and death, I brought up, like, Koshe the Deathless, the, the ogre. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the story of, like, you know, for people who don't know it, it's like there's this ogre, he can't die because his heart is, like, kept inside of, like, it's like a, a Matryoshka doll, it's, like, inside all these things, and you, if you can't get to the middle of it, you can't kill him. Glomide Queen is essentially that, like, I'll take the thing that can harm Goblin and put it in my other child. Mm-hmm. And I think, like, that's entirely in keeping with how America acts throughout this game. Because she, she's appalling to her children. She basically has nothing to do with her children up until Godwin dies and then she snaps and then she's like okay everyone just kill each other and whoever is the best at the end is going to take over wow so it entirely fits with like something that Marika would do also it happening like that early on would also completely explain why like no one knows her name because the very very founding of everything there's like this other kid we cut them out then and that's why, like, you know, there's no statues of her. She doesn't have, like, her own region or anything like that. Or you could argue maybe the Snowfields is kind of her region. But she's not right. really given anything. All we know about her is, like, she was just this sort of figurehead that led a cult of people that wanted to kill the gods. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also, like, it happening that long ago also explains why, like, the whole I want my kids to fight each other until they get strong enough to, like, succeed me doesn't apply to her because she would have been kicked out a long time ago. Right. So it just doesn't apply to her because she they got rid of her so, so long ago. So this kind of, like, raises the question of motivation. Because mm-hmm. taking into account everything I just said, you might think, okay, does she just want revenge? 
kind of sounds like it. Sounds like I mean that it's it's feasible that like literally like she's just she was treated badly. She got kicked out, and then she turned against them because she wanted revenge on the way she was treated. Um, it's actually kind of like Moog. Okay. Moog is not specifically driven by revenge, but the idea that like Moog is technically one of the demigods. He's technically uh could succeed the throne if everyone else died and they only had the horrible the horrible monster left but at the same time like he's he's not so much driven by revenge he just wants to found his own dynasty Mm -hmm. like even though he is like even though he's he's kicked out and thrown in a sewer like shortly after he's born um something about him is like he's got that sort of ambition that the other children have like he feels like he should be a lord of something he feels like he should have a dynasty he clearly knows who the other children are because he kidnaps Mikola. like he's clearly tuned into things um so glomide queen could be something like that she's someone who like has a birthright that she's been denied so she's sort of she's constructing something to get that back like she's going to kill the gods and take over like that's possible Mm -hmm. but um getting back to what we were saying like way earlier saying the glomide queen wants to skin the gods is like that's not necessarily her goal per se like it could be a means to an end it's like godric and arms like yes godric wants to stick arms on himself but he's not doing it for the sake of sticking arms on himself he's doing it because he wants something yeah yeah so what is really interesting about the way the godskins are described is that it says they're, they're assimilating non-human physiology into themselves. Okay. That's why they have tails. So it's not just that intimidation thing like you were suggesting. It obviously is intimidating to be confronted with someone who is wearing your skin <laughs> yeah, and yeah. is wielding the one thing that can kill you. It's a little intimidating. Yeah, like they and like there's reference, like you know, they're sort of they're quite cruel people. Like they enjoy like the cutting and the stitching and everything and the peeling. You also see it like in Dominola, like there's this whole cult of people who are, you know, they're they're trying to like skin people. It's like, and it becomes a big ritual thing. But again, like they specify that they're assimilating this physiology into themselves, and on the swaddling cloth of the godskins. It also, like, it explicitly likens it to the crucible. Mm -hmm. And the crucible is the thing that, like, all life began in. Like, it specifies there's this thing called the crucible. All life was sort of blended together into this, like, primordial goo. And then that sort of held within it all the potential for life. And then what we're dealing with now is, like, a specific route it could have taken, but it didn't need to. Like, Marika sort of laid down rules about how it was going to work. And that's why you end up with, like, humans, but there's also, like, misbegotten, and there's also omens, and there's also, like, whatever the Crucible Knights look like under the armor. There's all this implication that, like, Marika exposure to that did something to the way that life functioned, and she's not completely in control of it. So likening that to the Crucible is, I think, really interesting, because it does say that, like, okay, there's more to it than just skinning people. Like, you're specifically getting, like, the bodies of the gods... And you're taking parts of them into you. And that itself is viewed as similar to this crucible thing that happened. Where, like, presumably all these bodies were blended together. Not literally, but the idea of, like, human bodies and animal bodies and, like, plants and things. There was no dividing line. And the godskins are kind of breaking that down again. So, sort of wrapping up, like, okay, what is she doing? And why is she doing it? The swaddling cloth is particularly interesting to me because um, it's not clear, like, is the infant being swaddled, is that a godskin infant in that the godskins just have godskin children, like they somehow reproduce between each other? Um, Is it the glomide queen's child? Or is it just that, like, infants are sort of indoctrinated into being a godskin when they're an infant by swaddling them? Like, it's not clear. It could be any of those three things. It is weirdly talked about the godskins are almost like their own race of people rather than, like, a cult, which is possible. The, The Dominola, like, skinning thing, again, possible, like, they may just be a cult and sort of people are, are brought into it. Um, but, like, the idea of her creating these children out of death is really interesting because it's it's similar to what Fia and Dung Eater are doing. Um, Fia and Dung Eater, like, they're their own story, but Fia and Dung Eater are, like, they're interesting in that they're sort of counterpoints with each other. Like, they both produce, like, they, they 
conceive, literally they conceive very explicitly, conceive like a rune. And they do it by lying with corpses, um, just in different ways. So what uh, Glowmine Queen is kind of doing is like she's doing something like that, where she's getting that sort of binary between life and death that Marek is obsessed with preserving. And she's able to create like life out of it, maybe not necessarily like literally birthing a new person out of these dead skins, but the idea that you become a god, like the god skins reproduce as a group through the use of the dead. Yeah. Um, So in a sense, like she is founding her own dynasty. It's almost like she's getting bits and pieces like of the demigods and sort of like bringing that sort of god biomass like back into her children. And it's like, this is like maybe like the children she would have had, had she not been kicked out. But also like going back to what Melina says, like if we assume they're at least connected and maybe some of Melina's thoughts are the thoughts of the Glomite Queen, like what she was thinking, that notion of like the land needs indiscriminate death. Like if she was the one who had to spend like hypothetically, like your job is to spend eternity watching over destined death to make sure your brother doesn't die. That line Melina has about like, I've long observed these lands and they need indiscriminate death. That's like probably closer to like the Glomide Queen's motivation. Like she's trying to create like a new dynasty of people who are tied to the notion of like death can be indiscriminate. People don't have to live forever. And that is articulating in a very sort of like gory, cruel sense through the Godskins and through the Dominola Celebrants, that they are like cutting up and skinning people and wearing that. But at the same time, like it seems to serve this purpose, which is that it's changing them. It's making them more godlike. The things Marika sort of cut off, it's bringing them back together. It's almost like recreating like the Crucible. It's it's fusing these things back together again. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of like it's another way of approaching this like this life and death binary that Elden Ring is really interested in looking at. Um, Elden Ring is like it's just very interested in the idea that like you're never really like alive or dead, like you're kind of always dying. And Marika is kind of about the denial of that. It's about wanting everything to be in these like very neat living dead boxes, and she just doesn't want anything dead. So like the glow my queen seems to be another like aspect of that. Like she's just very, very like explicitly blurring that line. Hey, it's uh, from Software President Hidetaka Miyazaki here. Busy working on my robot game, but uh, these bitches got me on speed dial, so I've been dragged away from that to apparently uh, provide some comic relief. Luckily, I've uh, spent the last decade being forced to do things at short notice, so... uh, Where did Ocelot go after Oceros dropped him? Everywhere! Got some bad news today. The CEO of Bandai Namco was hit by a bus, and I lost my job as a bus driver. How do you stop Yui from walking around in circles? Chain his other foot to the chair. Thank you, you've been a great audience. Uh, Back to whatever this was, the, the goth lady was George's idea. There's the guy in Dominola who's saying, like, don't skin me, my skin's not worth it. Yeah. So there's something about, like, the purity of the skin that's important. This is why I keep going back to, like, yeah, what they're doing is, like, it's like you said, it was, like, something from Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. It's just, like, a very, very, like, sadistic, like, horrible thing. But there does seem to be a point to it beyond the sadism that's, like, we are trying to... We're trying to do something with this, like, divine body parts that we've gotten. We're using those to create new life in a way that's, like, counter to what Marika wants. Because, like, I'd say, like, most of the stuff in Elden Ring is, like, it's, like, a commentary on Marika's own obsessions. But, like, she's very much, like, the god of the world. 
Like she, she sort of sets this world up and then everything that goes wrong with it essentially happens because of something that like Marika did, like Marika's insistence on doing something, Marika's obsession shape it, Marika's like failings create all these problems. So the Godskins aren't that bad after all. They're looking no, out they for the little guys. They're, no, they're... Okay, this is, some, this is something we need to address, right? <laughs> yes. Because there's, a, a, I think, a lot of people are like, oh, well, um, such and such is, like, particularly Rani. It's like, oh, Ra- Rani's overthrowing the Golden Order. She must be good. And it's like, let's look at who's opposed to the Golden Order. Like, Rikard also wants to overthrow the Golden Order. All the demigods on some level are, like, rebelling. like. So this is bringing up something about Elden Ring that I think is like worth talking about um, a little bit now, which is like just wanting to overthrow the Golden Order does not mean that you're a good person. Mm-hmm. Like they set this up with the Eternal Cities, where it's like yes, the the Golden Order is this like totalizing thing. It's like a, a colonizing force that's sort of taken over. It's trying to shape the world according to what it wants. But that doesn't mean that it's like like the end of Return of the Jedi or something. Like you just blow it up and it goes away and everyone's happy again. Because once <laughs> it's like integrated itself into the world, if you just rip it away, you end up with like, there's like a vacuum into which like Astell shows up. And another example of like people who want to overthrow the Golden Order, like Rikard wants to overthrow the Golden Order. I don't think he should be in charge. I'm not going to side with him just because he wants to overthrow the Golden Order. Like... But he loves snacks, so yeah, let's agree yeah. to disagree. Okay, we'll agree to disagree then. I mean, <laughs> I'll sigh with him because he's very, very funny. But, like, <laughs> and it's also the whole thing with Rani. It's like, I know a lot of people consider Rani's ending, like, the good one. Mm-hmm. Um, because, like, she's like, oh, we'll create a new order of, like, under the form of the light and the wisdom of the moon and everything. But, like... A lot of that just comes from the fact it's Rani and she's a cute little witch. Like, if you imagine that ending, but it, but it's Celibus. And he's like, oh, yes, my age will be one of the stars. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, it, it's a lot creepier. So, like, like, the point is, like, you don't know. Like, it doesn't actually have, like, a defined, like, these are the good people, these are the bad people in that situation. Like, I'm not saying Marek is good. I'm just saying that, like, it's not it's not a case of saying, like, this person opposes Marika, therefore, by definition, they're all right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know who is right in Elden Ring? Blagged Big Boggart, the prawn guy. That's exactly what I was yes. thinking. Is Marika the character about whom we've talked the most, um, despite her having literally no dialogue? You get Melina's little little statements about it, but like she, Marika's on screen for like ten seconds total in the game. It's like Lawrence again. <laughs> yeah. If this one single force of personality and the and everything is descending from them, so the whole world is almost like everything there is an articulation of one person's issues, and that allows you to like fully flesh out like who Marika is without Marika actually being on screen because everything that's happening there is something that Marika is either directly or indirectly responsible for happening which is why we can talk about like all the stuff about Godwin even though Godwin's like Godwin literally has no lines in the game it's like you know those people who analyze people's behavior based on like eye twitches and hand movements yeah we're doing that for Elden Ring based on the world Unlike those people, no one in Elden Ring's real. So we're not going to release a video about, like, you can tell Marika's guilty because of how she's touching her nose. 